everyone. Welcome to, to this session. Thank you for the opportunity to present remotely. I uh, appreciate the convenience. Uh, so I'm, I'm Chin Meshoman. Uh, I'm currently the head of product at, at Startree, which is a company um, uh, which provides a managed solution on top of Apache Pino. Uh, and, and today I'll be talking about uh, you know, what is Apache Pino and whether it can replace uh, your OLTP database. Uh, so we'll begin with a quick intro to OLTP and uh, talk about the various use cases uh, that we see and uh, primarily the challenges that we see in some of these OLTP use cases. Uh, and we'll also discuss uh, the high-level workings of Apache Pino uh, and then how it can overcome some of these challenges uh, by way of complementing or at times even replacing the primary OLTP database. So, so let's get into it. Uh, OLTP, uh, as you, most of you probably already know, stands for Online Transaction Processing. Uh, this is the most popular uh, category of databases in, in the world. Pretty much every engineer has either used it or, or heard of this. Uh, the, the, some of the popular ones are listed here on the left, like MySQL and Postgres. Uh, and, and they all share some common characteristics. Uh, for instance, uh, they all have asset semantics. It stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Uh, what, what this means in practice, it, you get read after write guarantees uh, of, of your data. Uh, they also are built for high query performance. Uh, so they offer very, uh, they, they are able to support very high QPS uh, on, on your data, as well as low query latency. We're talking about single digit milliseconds. Um, due, due to its popularity, we have seen OLTP databases used in a wide variety of use cases. Um, the traditional ones uh, being something like entity data management, where you're managing your customer profile or product information in, in, in your database. Uh, others such as e-commerce and banking, uh, they rely on OLTP for financial transactions. Uh, to make sure we can do that at scale and also the, the accuracy of queries is, is very high. Uh, in addition, we have also seen other use cases, uh, uh, primarily analytics, where people are using uh, OLTP databases to surface insights uh, to their customers uh, or even things like business reports and, and dashboards for their internal employees. So if you look at all these different use cases, you, you start to see certain uh, uh, patterns uh, of, of the data. So on the right side, you have data coming from API endpoints or, or web application or microservices who are writing a record at a time in, into the database. And the read side uh, is, uh, is of two types. Either it's transactional, where you're reading a, uh, a key value style lookup. So for a given key, give me all the columns uh, in, in the database. Uh, or it could be analytical, where you're doing things like uh, fit, uh, uh, slicing and dis dicing by dimensions, or doing aggregations and group by, and maybe even joints uh, on this data. And in analytical case, you're typically only referring to a subset of the columns. You're not trying to retrieve all, all the data in, in the database. Um, so if you try to uh, break down what this means, right, in terms of the requirements of the database, um, for transactional access pattern, this is what we see. So the query complexity requirement is not that is not that high. Most of the queries are simple lookups uh, for a given key. Um, <clears throat> the data retention is moderate. So you're storing typically weeks or maybe months of data in the database. Um, <clears throat> the query performance needed uh, is quite high. So you need very high QPS support as well as very low uh, query latency support. Uh, and then finally, high degree of query accuracy. Uh, if you look at OLTP databases, they can all, uh, they satisfy all these constraints just fine. They're really built for these, this kind of access pattern. But when you start looking at analytical access pattern, the, you see a different story. Right? So you, your query complexity now uh, starts becoming high because you're not doing joins and, and group by and order by on your data. Um, the data retention can be very high. So now for analytics, you often store may, maybe many years worth of data or all data of, of all time in your database. Um, throughput and latency still 
um, pretty the SLA requirement is pre uh, pretty stringent, um, especially for user facing analytics. When you're serving insights to your millions of customers, you need high throughput and, and low query latency. Uh, and accuracy is also important uh, because many times you're generating business metrics and making decisions based on these metrics. So you need a high degree of accuracy. And in this case, uh, we do see that OLTP databases don't meet all of this criteria. So for, for instance, uh, either the some of these databases, it's difficult to scale them up to store you know, terabytes or petabytes of data, uh, or it, it might be cost prohibitive. They're not really built for the, this kind of data scale. Similarly, although transactional throughput and latency was great in terms uh, when it comes to complex queries, the, the throughput and latency requirements uh, for, for OLTP databases are oftentimes not met. Uh, and the primary reason is the way these databases are built, right? So all of these, the, the, the ones that we saw on, on the first intro, they all have a row-oriented uh, layout of the data. So when the data is persisted, you store uh, rows of data together. Uh, and this is this is a pattern that's not really designed for doing analytics, right? So uh, the reason is you, you it leads to inefficient data access, uh, especially for such analytical queries where you're only trying to retrieve a certain subset of the columns. The row-oriented format forces the entire row to be scanned uh, from from the disk and then brought into memory, uh, which is a big overhead um, and, and that affects your throughput and latency. Um, it also does not allow uh, uh, good compression because now you're interleaving different data types in the, in the row when you're storing it in a chunk or subset of the data. Um, because of this, you know there is a significant storage and query overhead um, for the OLTP database. Uh, and finally, it also uh, does not give you the opportunity to parallelize your query processing. So if you have database operations happening on different columns, uh, they cannot be parallelized in, in case of a, in case of OLDBDB. So to we have seen a stopgap uh, where to overcome some of these challenges, uh, people often do pre-processing of the raw data using frameworks like, like Flink and Spark and Lambda and so on. So for example, uh, what this is what we refer to as ingestion time materialization, right? So if you, uh, as an example, if you want to generate an insight on the total sales or total revenue, and this needs to be sliced and diced by the geography or the time or, or the channel, um, you can use, uh, you can build a, a cube or a materialized view of this particular metric, sum of all the revenue um, for all kinds of combinations of these dimensions, right? So uh, as an example, uh, right, if, if you want to generate an insight on, give me the total revenue for New York that happened last Sunday through our online channel, um, you would actually uh, generate multiple different values of, of revenue uh, for a particular city, particular time, uh, and, and the channel. And then at query time, you would stitch all these values together to generate a final answer. So, so what you're doing here is you're turn, turning the analytical access pattern back into a transactional access pattern. You're going back to a key value style lookup. Um, so this, uh, it, it, in some cases, this lets you scale up your analytical query. So you can still support uh, somewhat better QPS and latency. But this approach is also pretty problematic, right? Uh, now you're introducing many moving parts in, in, your, in your ETL pipeline. Um, there is still a, a storage overhead because as you can imagine, uh, for one metric, uh, you are generating a large fan out of the data based on how many dimensions uh, you, you are using. So if you, for example, if you want to generate uh, a metric per city or, or maybe even more granular, like a, a particular block of the city, you're now talking about you know, millions of different uh, rows that you need to generate from this pipeline. Uh, the query overhead, although it's not as bad as the analytical query, it, it's still high because you still need to stitch 
all these different values at runtime to generate the final answer. And then more importantly, uh, this pattern is not ideal because it's very inflexible. Right? So it's very difficult to change the computation uh, uh, once it's defined or do things like uh, data backfill or data correction that becomes uh, extremely problematic. Um, so in, in, you know, if you step back and, and look at all these use cases, <clears throat> you can see the that OLDP databases, although they are being used today for analytics, it's not really uh, suitable for, for these use cases. Uh, and this is where <clears throat> systems like Apache Pinot uh, were born to, to tackle these kind of analytical use cases. For those who haven't heard of Apache Pino, uh, it's an open source columnar database uh, coming out of LinkedIn. Uh, it's able to ingest data from various data sources like Kafka, S3, GCS, um, and then make it available for querying in real time. You can build all kinds of different use cases, uh, especially the ones that we saw before. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, <clears throat> it's a pretty popular product as of today. It's being used by you know, thousands of companies around the globe. And we see it being used in various different verticals like retail, such as 7-Eleven, Walmart, or banking, uh, where Stripe and WePay and, and Citibank have, have used it. And especially in, in logistics, where we see a massive adoption with Uber and DoorDash and, and so on, right? So we, uh, this the, the applicability is pretty widespread um, across the different industries. Uh, as an open source project, it's also the community is pretty uh, it's large and, and growing. Uh, so far, we've had about 5,000 Slack members and 11 million uh, Docker downloads, which is a great growth in a short amount of time. Uh, and, and let me also uh, touch upon the, the high-level architecture, which will help in understanding why Pinot uh, solves a lot of the problems that we've seen before. Uh, as I mentioned, it's an uh, analytical database, and a table within Pinot uh, is broken up into what we call uh, segments. Uh, so each segment consists of the data laid out in a columnar fashion. So instead of a row-oriented format, now you have, have a column format along with uh, any of the indexes you, you have configured uh, on any of these columns. Uh, it is a distributed system. So we these segments are then distributed across uh, various data nodes or Pinot servers. We have a Pinot broker, uh, which is used for query processing. And then there's a Pinot controller, which is used for cluster operations. So this is a very high level view of Pinot. <clears throat> <clears throat> so let's get into the uh, the first scenario. Right? So how can uh, Pino help uh, build these analytical use cases and complement uh, the OLDP database? Right. So in scenario one, uh, we will still have a primary OLDP database, but we will offload some of the data into Pino to build the specific analytics uh, that is needed uh, for for your uh, for your use case. So in this case, <clears throat> we uh, we have the same flow, but the data is still flowing into the primary OLTP DB, and we will use a change data capture uh, or CDC stream to capture some of the data uh, into Pino, and then uh, use that to build uh, the different use cases. Uh, so in, in, I'll, I'll show a quick demo where I'll be using MySQL for uh, for the OLTP DB. And I'm using Debezium and, and Kafka uh, to capture the CDC stream and, of course, Apache Pino um, uh, for, for the analytical DB. So let me switch screens. Um, so I have, I have uh, using Docker to just spin it, spin it all up locally. Uh, as you can see, I have my, my SQL running. Uh, I have my Kafka Connect framework, which is uh, running the Debezium process. Uh, Kafka itself, and then Pino. And if you look at my MySQL database, uh, it, it has some uh, tables such as addresses, customers, uh, orders, and, and so on. Right? So let me now create some tables in, in Pino uh, that will, uh, as I mentioned, it will tap into the CDC stream for some of these tables and then bring that data into Pino. 
so uh, so th- this uh, this all happened in real time where now i'm getting things like customer information directly in in pino uh, and the addresses and and the orders also now in pino so now that it is in pino i i can actually now start doing uh, analytics on top for example if you want to join across all these tables where you want to simply see uh, give me the the customers and the state where a transaction is happening um for a given order i i can do that with a simple join query uh, that looks like this um, this is basically joining across the three tables that we saw uh from from my sql uh and you can also do you know more complex things uh, such as uh let's say you want to see which states uh have the highest number of transactions happening for this database right um and in this case we see uh, right now georgia is leading uh in terms of total transactions so let's do one more thing which is to generate uh some more uh ordered inf- orders in real time so in this case we are going to uh generate uh, new customers new addresses and, and new orders into the into the database into my sql and as you'll see here uh it in real time all that the changes that have happened on my sql got uh, were captured by dbsm into kafka and finally into pino all within seconds and and in pino i can now do the same query uh where i have more information uh, and now vermont is actually now the leading state for doing for, for most transactions so this is an example where <clears throat> you can use this pattern to offload all your analytical queries uh into pino and this is where you can configure various kind of indexes uh, uh on on your database to to generate very low query latency uh, in milliseconds for, for this data So if you had to do the same query on MySQL, uh, you would actually have much lesser QPS and uh, latency, or very high latency. Let me switch back to my demo. <clears throat> so this was an easy one, right? Where this is a common pattern where uh, you use CDC is being used to offload uh, some of the data for for analytics. One one other thing to keep in mind is uh, Pino also has has a good framework for doing data bootstrap and backfill so if you for the first time users uh, if you want to uh, bootstrap uh, data from mysql or let's say you know for the last few months you can actually do that using pino's minion framework uh, which runs as an offline process it, it uh, fetches data from mysql uh, generates segments offline and just loads them into pino so it's kind of like the the batch upload feature feature of of mysql um the other good thing is in pino you can align all these segments on some time boundary like an hour or a day uh, and then you can do backfills very easily so if you want to do backfills for a given hour or day that becomes super easy with with this kind of a framework um <clears throat> so now you see the the requirements that we saw before uh pino is actually able to satisfy these requirements right primarily the data retention throughput and latency it, it's it's a columnar database so it's built for uh very large scale uh, data terabytes or even petabytes um and i'll talk about in in the next section i'll talk about the secret sauce of pino why it uh, it it can also support you know tens of thousands of qps uh, for analytical queries uh, in in milliseconds <clears throat> but before that let me also talk about um are there scenarios where we can actually replace the old db database so we don't in this case you know we we will look at an architecture like this right so you have uh, a lot of the modern companies especially we, we see this kind of an architecture where the data originating from the api endpoints or microservices uh flow into a medium like kafka instead of an old db database uh and then the, it, kafka becomes essentially becomes a distributed change log of all the things that are happening uh in in your uh, uh back end or infrastructure uh and then uh, you need a platform that can do both right you 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 need to generate insights for your customers as well as uh 
show some basic things like customer profile. In this case, I've taken Uber's example, where Uber is showing uh, customer information, uh, in this case, a driver, as well as the insights such as <clears throat> the hourly average or the how much revenue the, the driver is generating and which times revenue is higher for that driver. Uh, so typically, you would use you know OLTP database for the entity data and then uh, something like Pino for the analytical data. But what if you could actually use one platform for both? And then and the requirements look, uh, if you look at the requirement, they look very similar to the previous uh, things we have seen uh, before where the query complexity is high as well as the requirement of you need very high QPS and very low latency for serving this kind of data. So this is what we call as hybrid serving and analytical processing, right? This is a term that was originally coined by Alibaba in their paper. Uh, and, and this is what we see uh, companies are actually adopting Pino for, right? And, and uh, it does support all these requirements. So let me talk about, you know, what, what in Pino makes this possible? Uh, so if you go back to the architecture that I discussed before, you have the uh, Pino broker for query processing, um, and then the Pino servers, uh, uh, which manage the, the segments, which actually host the data and indexes. Uh, so without any optimization, uh, when you send a query to, to Pino, the broker will simply forward the query to all the servers, in this case, one, two, and three. And then in turn, uh, without any optimization, the server will uh, process the data from all the segments that are locally hosted on, on each of these servers. Right? So in, in, in for a given query like this, you're actually going to process uh, all 12 of these segments as, as shown here. So the job of query optimization is to reduce the number of segments that need to be processed for generating an answer. And this happens across uh, very many different uh, layers in Pino. Uh, so a lot of the optimizations happen at the broker layer itself. So without even looking at the data, it can uh, prune some of these segments. Uh, so for example, if you have a, a, a where clause in your query, where you're doing filtering based on a certain time segment, uh, or you're doing <clears throat> query based on if your data is partitioned and you're doing query for a certain partition of the data, it can automatically uh, uh, ignore some segments based just based on the metadata of, of each segment. Um, so in, in this case, in this example, we actually eliminated four segments. <clears throat> uh, so then when the query comes at the server layer, the server can use uh, a bloom filter to further uh, prune segments uh, without again scanning any any data at this point. So so far we have not touched any data, and so we are only looking at either a bloom filter or metadata to to ignore certain segments. Um, so in this example again, it it was able to discard uh, some of these segments, and then finally um, at a segment level, there are further optimizations that can help uh, reduce the amount of work done for for a given query. So when the query happens at a segment level, um, we use the uh, power of indexing in Pino to minimize the, the amount of work done, right? And this can this happens in both the filter phase as well as the aggregation phase. Um, so we have a bunch of indexing options which, which aid in both of these, right? So we have inverted index and sorted index and range index. Uh, these come in handy when you have a numerical filter Right. So if you're doing, you know, where ID equal to uh, 23 or where the uh, where the time is between a certain range uh, of T1 and T2, uh, this is where these indexes can help accelerate the query processing at a segment level. Um, Pino also supports uh, JSON and text index for doing semi-structured uh, processing on, on the data. So you can actually do prefix or reject search on, on your data, uh, as well as JSON, uh, like very fast JSON uh, nested uh, uh, nested query uh, JSON on, on Pino data directly. We also have geospatial index. This was actually uh, something Uber added for their use case, where it, it, uh, it can quickly 
uh, do things like point and polygon query. So if you want to identify, give me the location of all the rides that are happening within a given uh, custom geofence, it can actually be, uh, it, it can leverage the geospatial index in Pino. Uh, on the aggregation side, uh, we have uh, theta sketches in hyperlog log and t-digest for doing approximations uh, which are often used in, in, in for insights where you don't need high degree of accuracy, but you need the aggregation to be very found uh, to be very fast. So, for example, distinct count HLL is a common uh, optimization we have seen in, in, that many companies used. And then finally, star tree index. Uh, so, star tree index is is uh, is uh, is sort of an intelligent materialized view, right? So it, helps in both the filter optimization as well as an aggregation optimization. So in the example from before, where you're doing total sales uh, across three dimensions, like the, the city and in time and uh, channel, starting index will actually um, pre-aggregate these values across all these dimensions. Um, so, but, but it does that in an intelligent fashion, where it's not doing full materialization. So it, it gives you a knob on how much materialization you want to do versus how much scanning you want to do for the query. So it, it avoids some of the uh, storage overhead issues we saw before, but at the same time, it, it gives you very, very high query performance. Uh, and these indexes, uh, they matter a lot for, for the use cases uh, we just saw, right? So these are some of the benchmarks uh, where you're comparing raw scans versus uh, uh, an index, uh, the query with, with an index on the same column. And you can see there are many orders of magnitude difference uh, between the latencies when an index is applied. And, and the best part is, <clears throat> uh, A, these indexes can be applied on any of the columns in, in your table. And you can add that at any point within the table. So if you already have a table, uh, you can go back and add an index. Uh, so you can really iterate quickly on, on, on your schema. Um, as you develop with Pino. And especially true with star tree index, which is used in, in many cases for the user-facing analytical workload. So LinkedIn, for example, uh, when it's generating, uh, you know, what content rec to recommend for a given user, uh, with this is, you know, uh, many, many thousands of, tens of thousands of QPS. Uh, star tree index helps uh, power this high, high QPS and, and still, gives you ability to serve these queries within let's say 10 milliseconds uh, so the, these indexes all these indexes and the optimization techniques is what gives pino the ability to uh, support very high qps and very low latency uh, and this is sort of the design principle right the the idea in pino is to uh, minimize the work done for a given query so even if your data size uh, grows a lot, so in, in, in for example, terabytes or petabytes, uh, Pino is still able to maintain the, the query latency because of all these optimizations. Uh, this is not something we have seen in other databases. In other databases, uh, it might look good in the beginning for small data, but the minute you scale it up, uh, the query performance degrades pretty quickly. Um, so coming back to, you know, so we, we discussed the speed of Pino, but for a HSAP, um, the accuracy of queries is also very important. So if you make um, an update to your customer profile or driver profile, uh, Pino must be able to uh, reflect that correctly on, on, uh, on the app or the website, right? So this is where query accuracy is important. Uh, and this is supported in Pino today through the through the real time upsearch mechanism. And so you have, if you have uh, the data in Kafka, if you're getting inserts or updates or deletes, uh, Pino can actually uh, process that correctly, and and, uh, and the queries the query automatically becomes consistent uh, with with these changes. And these are some of the design highlights that that uh, when we built upsearch in Pino, right? So. One is most of the, the work is done during ingestion or write time. Um, and and uh, this helped us you know, make sure there's a minimal query overhead. Uh, so you can still do very high QPS and then low latency in Pinot in the presence of inserts and updates and deletes. 
Um, and similarly, you know, when when we do uh, the same optimization that we saw before, help in in filtering out obsolete records in 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 at the segment level. Uh, and within Starty Cloud, <clears throat> we have also uh, made sure this is scalable. So you can store uh, many billions of primary keys um, per server uh, for, for a given table. Uh, and the memory requirement is also pretty efficient for, for processing all these changes in real time. Uh, the other advanced features that have gone in recently um, that, that also help in, in making this use case easier is things like partial upsorts. So oftentimes you have updates that flow in at a column level. You don't get a full row of uh, change, change that you do in Debezium, but oftentimes you only see like a particular column, like an address, for example, is updated. And partial upsorts help you uh, automatically process that. And you know, uh, the other things it, it supports is the bootstrap and backfill. So if you have you know years worth of data that you want to bootstrap quickly, uh, that is the, supported through the through the minion framework, and finally compaction, right? So if you, as you can see, this is this is kind of like LSM, where you keep updating uh, new data, uh, and then the old data becomes obsolete. Uh, you do need compaction to to clean up uh, and then reduce the the storage overhead uh, in in your, in your database, and and that is support both compaction as well as roll up. Uh, th that's something that's supported in, in Pino uh, in the presence of upsets. And we see this in, in practice, right? So these are real world production numbers where, uh, you know, LinkedIn, as I already mentioned, one uh, one cluster is doing, you know, more than 200,000 queries per second uh, in production. Stripe, we have seen uh, adopt Pino in a big way where they're using that for powering their uh, merchant portal and an internal fraud metrics uh, and they see you know less than 50 millisecond p99 on pino and then uber has adopted one of the biggest adopters of pino uh, and they were the first ones to uh, you know build up certs and use it in production see many many billions of keys being used in, in, in within uber um so in in summary right so if you uh, just to summarize these two technologies uh, in terms of use case, we do see you know, OLTP is a great fit uh, for transactional uh, row-based actions, whereas Pino primarily built for analytics, but it also has support for HSAP, where if you want to do lookup uh, lookups for a given key and you want to have the same platform for both HS, like uh, serving as well as analytical purposes, Pino becomes a very good fit. Uh, query throughput, <clears throat> uh, the transactional databases are great in for transactional workloads, but not so great for analytical. Uh, same thing with latency. Query latency is very, very low for transactional workloads, uh, but not that great for analytical queries. Uh, and, and both these things, uh, Pino, as you, as you saw before, is actually built for analytical uh, workloads. And then uh, on the serving side, it can still sustain uh, the throughput and query, the latency requirements for, for data serving. Uh, for large data volume, right? Uh, I, I mentioned before, OLTP database becomes uh, cost prohibitive if you want to store petabytes of data, uh, many hundreds of terabytes of data even. Uh, it, it becomes a, it's a big challenge for an OLTP database, whereas Pino, you can simply add more machines. You can spread out these segments very easily um, and, and the uh, more importantly, the columnar layout gives us the opportunity to compress the data in a very efficient manner. Uh, so it, it becomes much more cost efficient. In addition, within Starty Cloud, uh, we have the ability to offload uh, this data into an object store like S3. So you, you, if you have you know many years of data, uh, you can actually offload historical data into the cloud. And you can pin the indexes locally, uh, so you can still get uh, millisecond level query performance in, in this manner. And then finally, accuracy, right? Most of the uh, OLTP databases have serializable consistency, um, which is very strict. Uh, with Pino, uh, you can get read after write semantics uh, because of the, the way uh, the ingestion works, uh, and, and especially true with, with Kafka, where the you have the guaranteed order per partition that lets you, uh, you lets you achieve these semantics with, with Pino. So, you know, in conclusion, you know, Pino 
it's not going to replace all the use cases for sure and old for the for OLDP, but definitely a good fit uh, for some of these use cases as, as you saw before. And lastly, if you want to try this out yourself, uh, we do have a free forever workspace. You simply register and, and try it out for free on this on this URL, starty.ai slash free. With that, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and uh, happy to answer any questions, if any. All right, does anyone in the room have questions? Okay, we have one. Um, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, my question would be, how do you uh, ensure uh, a fault tolerance? So I assume the data is stored on the nodes. Are you replicating the segments? Um, and how, how do you then maintain the indexes? That's right. Uh, yeah, good question. So if the data is indeed replicated across the servers, right? So what happens is for a given segment, you can define uh, the replication pattern. So each segment you can say replicated three times across the, the across the servers, and you can also do this in a rack of air manner. Um, so you can have one segment in each availability zone in your cloud uh, cloud deployment. Uh, so that that gives you the HA required uh, for the segments. As the same thing applies for the controller and broker. You can spread them out across different AZs. In terms of indexes, the indexes are actually local to a given segment. So each replica will have uh, the uh, the col the columns as well as the indexes uh, for for a given sec. Any more questions? So I guess this is it. Thank you so much for your presentation. Okay.